Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm, as Nick says, going to talk to you very briefly about systems and systems thinking. Yawn. I'm going to make it exciting, though, and give you some possible solutions, um, one of which involves baby food. So you've got about five minutes to work out the link between systems thinking, solutions to an unsustainable food system, and baby food. That's your challenge. And also, listen while um, you're thinking through that solution. So systems thinking sounds as though it can be really clever stuff. Um, and that's a good thing, because we've heard really eloquently this morning, um, Secretary of State included, that the food system is not sustainable, nor is it on a course to become sustainable any time soon. And that actually, when we try and address single issues in the food system, it doesn't work. There have been multiple interventions across multiple issues within the food system, and yet, we're still not looking at a system that's set for sustainability. I guess um, just a bit of personal experience of systems experience. Um, I'm reminded seeing all these slides of my um, PhD, which was really snappily entitled The Effects of Nitrogenous Atmospheric Pollution on Semi-Natural Ecosystems. For those of you that are not environmental scientists, this is the effect of nitrogen on um, ecosystems, which again we heard about this morning. And here, what I was looking at was the fact that heathlands were accelerating their transition into grasslands, and we were losing heathlands. And still in the UK, we've lost an awful lot of heathland. Now, much of that is due to excess nitrogen from the environment, and that in turn makes the heather more tasty to the heather beetle, that then wipes out the whole heather crop. And actually, the solution to that particular issue wasn't so much nitrogen deposition itself, but actually was slurry practices on pig farms. Go figure. So that's just an example of where some of the solutions that you need to address these big problems might not be as obvious as you might think. If you want to know more, I can bore you rigid later. But just hold that one for now. So what do we mean when we talk about systems thinking? It's very simply the process of understanding how things influence one another within a whole. So not picking off single issues and avoiding those unintended consequences. Um, what we need to do is to identify those features of the system that are driving its inherent unsustainability. As one of our business partners, Nike, calls them, those wicked problems that are really driving some inherent sustainability in a particular system. If we can get a handle on those problems, we can then think through the solutions that address those barriers or those problems. But those solutions need to be replicable, they need to be scalable, and they need to be capable of shifting the system. And happily, we've heard quite a few of those already this morning, and I can weave those into what I had already identified as my current top three solutions for shifting the food system. The first, Harriet, has just talked about this and sounds really obvious, but I don't see it happening to the scale that needs to be there to deliver real change. And that is whole value chains working together. For me, a key driver of the current unsustainability of the food system is the dysfunctionality of value chains. More often than not, the dynamics of the value chain mean that producers often lose out, as we've been hearing, and too much power not always, but often, sits with faceless, faceless procurement departments and the commercial teams. And whenever you mention the commercial teams, people go, oh, not the commercial teams. There are ways we, need, we can deal with this, but that dynamic isn't delivering for sustainability. Tackling this status quo isn't easy. If I had a pound or a euro or a, do or a dollar for every business partner of ours that said, well, I've got to get to the procurement guys, I've got to get to the commercial team. I'd be quite rich. Um, I might even have two suits, never, not just the one. But the problem is that this isn't easy, and tackling the status quo is not terribly easy. But movements such as fair trade offer alternatives, and I think that the Fair Trade Foundation has done some brilliant work here. And we heard already about the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, which to me is a bit of a poster child for how you can tackle these global commodities. And it shows how you can be successful when you bring the whole value chain together from the producer through to the brand and manufacturer, through to the retailer, and help switch to sustainable sourcing of a very important global commodity. Um, and clearly doesn't have all the answers, but to me is a template that needs to be scaled up and replicated. And here in the UK, um, we were very pleased at Forum for the Future to be involved in a project looking at sustainable dairy. 
Um, back in April at the Houses of Parliament, we launched a vision and a framework for sustainable dairy here in the UK, dairy2020.com, if you're interested. And for me, from palm oil to dairy, there are two key features which make it possible for value chains to work properly together. The first is clear boundaries on what is pre-competitive and what is competitive. And I think this has been a barrier to value chains coming together in the past, but I think that the dial between what is pre-competitive and competitive is moving quickly and in the right direction. Just a little story I heard from someone involved at the beginnings of the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. Originally, when this organisation published its targets about transitioning to 100% sustainable palm oil, they thought that that would deliver competitive advantage. They then realised, actually, to really transform the palm oil supply chain, they've got to do it in collaboration with what they hitherto were thinking were their competitors. And I think increasingly, if we look at those scary statistics, as we realise our fundamental reliance on the natural system, we are going to have to collaborate in very new and very different ways. So that's the first precondition for whole value chains coming together. And then the second, and we do a lot of this with Inform for the Future, is creating that shared vision of sustainability. Imagining what good looks like, imagining what a sustainable value chain looks like, can really bring people together and can prompt innovation and find new ways of tackling old problems. So that's my first solution, whole value chains coming together. As I say, not rocket science, but we don't see enough of it, in my view. And then the second solution, again, people have touched on this already this morning, we need to reconnect with the food that we eat. Millions of people, particularly in the West, in developed economies, are completely unconnected from where and how their food is produced. This, in turn, translates to a reluctance to pay the, the true price of food. The food that we buy, we don't pay the true price of it at the moment. Those external environmental externalities, no, those environmental externalities even, are not factored into the cost of the food that we buy, nor are those social externalities, by and large. And it also means we throw up to a third of it away because we don't value it. So again, there isn't a simple answer. We know that these are all issues that we've been facing for a while. But I do think that a range of options are now available. First of all, I would like to see brands and retailers much more actively engaging their consumers with how and where their favourite product is made. There are some really good examples out there right now. I think we have Tata Global Beverages in the audience who are behind the Tetley brand and the Tetley Tea's Farmers First Hand initiative where they're using Facebook to connect Tetley Tea drinkers with where their tea is made is a brilliant example of how you can bring those non-greens. Um, if you look at some of the posts on that Facebook page, they're not what you'd call the deep greens. People are talking about skydiving and all sorts of quite strange things. They're normal customers, normal consumers, and here they are finding out a lot more about where their tea is grown and how it's made. So actively engaging consumers is really important. And then second, instead of asking consumers what they want now, how about asking them what they might want in the future? It bewilders me that retailers in particular spend so much money on consumer insight groups, but they're asking about needs today, not about needs tomorrow. We did a piece of work uh, with Sainsbury and with Unilever called Consumer Futures looking, and surprisingly, at what the consumer in 2020 might be buying, how they might be living. And what this study showed, and we created in a number of scenarios, was that whether or not consumers demanded sustainability, and whether or not the economy had picked itself up, which not looking that likely right now, whether, whether or not, they, we, which way you look to those two variables, sustainable consumption in its broadest sense had mainstreamed because there are big trends pressing down on our operating context, which mean that sustainability is here to say. For example, resource shortages are only going to push the price of inputs up higher. And we've, talk, we've heard already uh, today about this trend of transparency. This is really revolutionizing how people f can interact with where and how, how they buy their food. So both this study and these weak signals that we see today, which is a trend to grow your own, for example, show for me that the era of a consumer as some detached entity or discombobulated entity, I wanted to get that word in today, at the end of a long linear value chain are numbered. 
I think that brands and retailers need to shift their perspectives and view consumers as potential producers, even if it's only waste that they're producing, because in a resource-constrained world, waste will be worth a lot more than it is today. So part of the solution here is to stop thinking about supply chains as these long, linear entities, but think of them as loops, with consumers as producers, producers as consumers. That way, I think we'll all start to value the food a lot more than we do today. And then my final solution, again, we've touched on this, but perhaps not quite as overtly. For me, the money has to work. Businesses in the audience today and across the world have a fiduciary duty. So it's not something that they quite like to do. It is a statutory duty to maximise shareholder value. Now, we might not like that, and secretly, we might be hoping for the downfall of capitalism, but that isn't going to happen anytime soon. It's certainly not going to happen in the timescale that we have to deal with some of the problems we've been hearing about today. But the good news is that increasingly the ability to generate returns is linked to how a business responds to these big environmental and social challenges. I've heard more than one SVP from a big multinational manufacturer say supply chains don't work very well when oil prices tip to $200 a barrel and where disruption is where production is completely disrupted due to extreme weather events. So the business case for sustainability is crystal clear. But yet we still have far too many businesses who, has, who are single-mindedly pursuing short-term profit maximisation with no eye on the bigger picture, although happily there are increasing numbers of businesses that do have an eye on the bigger picture. For me, the business that isn't aware of the impacts of these big societal and environmental trends on their business, they won't be around because actually they won't succeed in a low-carbon resource-constrained world. But we can't wait for these dinosaurs to become extinct, sadly. We need to usher in this new wave of businesses that are making sustainability work financially. And the first step in this transition is to align the business model with societal needs. I'm getting to the baby food bit, bear with me. For me, Unilever has done this on a massive scale. So by providing healthcare and hygiene to millions in the emerging economies, it's securing both short-term success and long-term value creation, baby food coming up. On a much smaller scale, the UK-based baby and toddler food manufacturer Ella's Kitchen also recognised the needs of those parents that were trying to feed little jars of broccoli and parsnip to their offspring, thinking they really don't like this, do they? They recognised the need that actually they wanted to feed, what parents want is to feed their children wholesome, hence organic in this case, and tasty food in something kind of better than a little pot, hence the pouches. Ella's Kitchen has got sustainability running through its business model and is actually one of the most successful export stories we have right here in the UK. That's the baby food bit. And also the money will work by taking a long-term view, by changing the risk-reward profiles, and by accepting soon that nature won't be free forever. Ask yourselves, how well does your business model work when, we've run, when nature is no longer free, and nor are the labour costs that you are reliant upon. And so, for me, these three solutions use examples of what we would call pioneering practice. The ultimate solution will come when we've scaled, scaled up this pioneering practice and created what we would call a tipping point. And this is where Rio comes in, because Rio needs to provide the policy framework that sustains that tipping point that means that actually we have a new mainstream where sustainable food is the norm. Thank you very much.